Now it's my honor to introduce Dr. Shapari, who um, has been um, at UB for um, 40 years and helped build Caesar. Um, Caesar? Caesar? Um, he says. Um, and um, this is a, uh, a center that we've had for many years at UB that um, developed um, concepts around pattern recognition, where one of the first applications of artificial intelligence was actually begun here that Dr. Srihari helped develop, and that is the Postal Service's ability to read with something like four or five nines accuracy our handwriting and have the letters delivered to the right address when we write it down by hand. And that pattern recognition was developed here, um, that the, the initiation of that was developed here in Buffalo at UB, and Dr. Shumhari is now going to talk to us about uh, where we are with artificial intelligence in Buffalo and um, at UB. Thanks, Chip, for that lovely introduction. I have here Alina Bereshka. She's a, a graduate student working uh, on reinforcement learning, a kind of uh, very cool uh, idea in machine learning today. So she'll be handling the audio visuals for me. Thanks, Bereshka. Thanks, uh, Alina, I should say. Yeah. So um, when Chanping asked me to give this talk, uh, I said, all right, let me talk broadly about AI. and. I always keep telling my students uh, over the years, over the last 40 years I've been teaching, that some of the uh, some of AI actually began in Buffalo. And in those days, it was in the early on, there weren't that many people interested in hearing about it. But uh, today, I think it's become very relevant. So I will talk about this. Uh, so, and when you see in the news media, they talk about AI as a new industrial revolution. It's going to change everything. The economy is going to be changing. Society is going to be changing. So, uh, so that's how they talk about it. And of course, uh, I said, okay, where is the story here about industrial revolution? Uh, truly, Buffalo has had a connection to several industrial revolutions. So I will trace the story how Buffalo had a role in the earlier industrial revolutions and how the current industrial revolutions began here in Buffalo. And what has been going on for the last 40, 50 years and my own speculations about where we are going. and. Uh, I'm, of course, part of this uh, utopian side of things as opposed to the dystopian side of things. That is, it's all going to be good as opposed to it's all going to be bad. Right? Anyway, I'll trace that story. So what I'm going to do is I'll talk about uh, humanity, human civilization, over the years has encountered maybe three or four, four maybe, uh, big technological revolution, the change in starting with the Industrial Revolution, going on to the Electrical Revolution, and then Electricity came on. And then the Computer Revolution, when everybody, or everything we started using computers. And now we are at the AI Revolution, which has, which got started quite some time ago, right here in Buffalo, we've been doing these kinds of things, but finally it is now you know, coming out into the open now. Uh, and so I'll place that history a bit. Uh, which is a little bit of an unlikely story uh, for everybody to hear about. Of course, that a central goal in all of these things? Yeah. Okay, let's go. So the grand technological revolutions that uh, humanity has dealt with, of course, you know, there was the first industrial revolution started with the Arkwright uh, water mill in England, and uh, they were then uh, converting various uh, handcrafted things uh, into machines uh, run by steam engines and so on. And uh, and so that was in the 1770s. Maybe Buffalo didn't have much to do with that part of industrial revolution because it was just being formed uh, over here in North America. But uh, anyway, a lot of our earlier industries here were, uh, were of that kind. But the real uh, revolutions that uh, Buffalo had a role in began with the electricity revolution when uh, electricity uh, changed everything, that now we had power, we had light, we could drive motors, uh, so many things we could do with, with, with electricity, refrigerators, uh, 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 you know, fans and heating and, and so on. You know, you know what electricity is used for, maybe garage door openers, what have you. Electricity drives everything. 
And Buffalo had a very central role in this thing because of Niagara Falls. Uh, there's been a lot of recent write-ups about this. Uh, Buffalo has been called the city of light. This is where this is the first city in the world to have had street lights powered by electricity. And uh, there was a very interesting story about uh, which is the first city in the world that had that got electricity. And there is some discussion about it. What happened was there was a war of currents, they called it. There was Thomas Alva Edison in New York, in the, in, in the East Coast, in New Jersey. Um, he, he, he lit up uh, Manhattan with uh, direct current. And, uh, and then they said, okay, we should, we should be able to generate electricity from hydro, uh, hydropower. And here was Niagara Falls. And they were going to generate power. And they were going to use uh, that power uh, to show what could be done with it. And they said, okay, let's go light up the streets of Buffalo with it. So, but uh, the engineer in charge of uh, uh, the, uh, the motors and all here was, his name was Nikola Tesla. So Tesla and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Thomas Edison were on opposite sides. Edison wanted DC and, uh, and Tesla wanted AC. He said, you know, if you're going to use a DC, you're going to have serious uh, power losses. Electrical engineers call it an I squared R losses. Right? Over that distance, there's a lot of resistance. So uh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, power is going to dissipate. It's not going to work, work well. And he wanted to put uh, DC in, uh, AC in the way. Yeah. Anyway, Tesla won out. And today, the norm is AC rather than Thomas Edison's DC. And, uh, and so anyway, Buffalo played a role in a very central way. And if you go to Niagara Falls, you would see a huge, huge statue of Nikola Tesla over there. So it's the origin of electrification. So Buffalo has a role in that whole revolution, which is the electrical revolution. Uh, moving on, say around 1970, uh, the, uh, this is all circa 1970, it be 20 years earlier, 20 years earlier, roughly, so was the revolution of computers that computers are going to take over everything. Time magazine made uh, a computer the man of the year, right? Some of you old enough may remember that. And uh, so the computer revolution played uh, a, a central role. And uh, uh, what I show here is an IBM 360 over here. We'll talk about it a little bit more. And uh, of course, today we talk about the fourth revolution, which is uh, artificial intelligence which is about uh, computers uh, or machines performing as well or better than human beings at a lot of tasks. And I put a, a, a dystopian picture over there. It was uh, IBM, uh, 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 that, I believe not IBM, it was the AlphaGo in Lee Sedol, the, uh, the world champion on Go. It's kind of that picture that is falling down. All right. So, uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, about this AI, what is AI has to call before we going on to the AI revolution? Uh, AI uh, is ubiquitous. We all have AI in our pockets uh, or in our cars. Uh, so what are the kinds of tasks that require intelligence? This is the kind of thing that AI does. Reasoning, like games, that AlphaGo we just saw was an achievement of, uh, of uh, the group uh, now, now with uh, Google. Uh, planning, we all use, uh, you, we all use uh, maps and things like that, action sequences and you know, they incredibly they can tell you the shortest way to go from, or if you're driving from here to New York City, it, it gives you different routes, uh, or maybe to Washington DC, I've driven several times, it gives you different routes every time, it's figuring out the traffic and so on, reasons out. So AI at work here, uh, natural language, we can type in natural language sentences into the Google search engine box, it figures out what you want or you can speak uh, into the Google search uh, using various handheld devices and figure it out. Sensors, uh, the picture I put at left is uh, a, 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 the path for, a, for an autonomous vehicle. A car is driving without, without hitting the uh, barriers on the side and the car the road is turning. It's uh, lowering the speed and uh, turning the steering wheel and so on using sensors. Uh, or we of course have things like uh, the uh, Alexa uh, where you can ask Alexia to wake you up or, uh, or call, call, your, call your wife or husband and so on. So AI is ubiquitous, it's already here doing intelligent things. So the AI, the argument here is that the AI revolution is already here. 
And one could argue in comparison to the industrial revolution, the AI revolution is larger. AI revolution of course disrupted society. AI revolution is larger. Steam engine uh, took over physical labor, but AI can perform both physical and intellectual labor. <laughs> Not only all these uh, kinds of things, uh, such as uh, finding a path or understanding language, but also possibly drive a car and so on. Uh, faster, uh, the AI revolution is faster. Industrial revolution took centuries. It might have started in England, but by the time it, and maybe America, by the time it uh, went around the entire world, it took a few hundred years. But this AI revolution is instantaneous. Simultaneously, it is going into place with, uh, all across the world. All right. So I'm again. I think I went over <laughs> this concept already. This is my slide about uh, the role of Buffalo in the electric uh, revolution. Uh, on the top right is the first uh, generating plant, which was not the current plant that exists. It was the Shulkoff plant. Uh, it is uh, still, I think, somewhere near the. Uh, Aquarium of Niagara Falls, around that area, there is a Shulkoff plant. That's what it looked like. It was generating power from it. And the bottom here, I found a picture of people rejoicing in Buffalo. That's a Buffalo picture with all the street lights, which came from Niagara Falls, from Shulkoff. And there is a statue of uh, Nikola Tesla, who invented alternating current in Buffalo, the place where it first went into uh, action. And visibly, there is a huge statue. Here. All right, now what about the computer revolution? Did Buffalo have anything to do with it? Around the 1970s or 60s, the computer suddenly became commonplace all over. Everybody began to use it. Interestingly, there's a nice connection to even the computer revolution. It may not be as strong as the first electric revolution. Thomas J. Watson, Jr., he's the one who founded IBM. And if you look up his biography, he actually spent uh, several years here in Buffalo. He was, uh, he was uh, a salesman here in Buffalo, and he was extremely good at it. And then he uh, went on, uh, he moved a little bit to the east, and he moved there, and he found it, his of IBM. And uh, I'll just put up a few pictures of IBM's enormous importance in the computer revolution of 1970. All of these I put up there, uh, in my own lifetime I've used these things. Uh, the first on the left hand is the IBM System I came here as a graduate student in that year, 1972, in America. And uh, I, I, had, I, you know, all my, I was a computer science major even at that time. So I used to write all my code and submit it in my jobs on, on punch cards to the IBM 360. That's what it looked like. And then later on, about 10, 15 years later, we had the uh, IBM PC with an IBM invention. Uh, and then um, much more recently, in the last decade, we have had uh, a, a program called Watson, named after Thomas Watson. Beat uh, Ken, the uh, world champion Jeopardy player at that time. That was also an IBM device called Watson. And they eventually they spun off uh, an AI unit called Watson. And uh, on the uh, uh, the fourth picture I have uh, next to Thomas uh, Watson is uh, a, a laptop, which I think you know, many people still use. It's called a ThinkPad. I believe it's still called a ThinkPad, right? Mm -hmm. And Watson came up with the, with the name Think. Word think. You know, he used to tell everybody that was his key phrase, and so uh, he's, uh, he, that word still lives beyond uh, Thomas uh, J. Watson. Now, uh, when I went to uh, went to, uh, came to America as a graduate student, I, I had to do all my programs uh, in punched cards. In the bottom, you can see over here punched card machine and a reading machine, and was also a machine where you 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 would sit in a key punch. And you would, uh, you would type in your code. Every line of your code would be a new card. So you would have a deck of cards, which would be a computer program. And you would put another card called a job control language card after that, followed by your data set, which is also punch cards. And you would feed the whole thing. So uh, when I came here as a graduate student, uh, I would uh, punch my cards on this punch card machine and submit it to an IBM 360. And after about four hours, they'd allow me to go and pick up my job. What, what it did, it would say, well, okay, you got a, you got a job control error, you know, you got a bug here, whatever, do it all over again. It used to take, you know, days to get a program right. Now, very interestingly, there's a Buffalo connection here. The one who came up with this idea of punch cards and the punch card machine was a man called Herman Hollerick. And look him up, Herman Hollerick was born in Buffalo. 
So he was born in Buffalo and went on uh, to uh, Washington DC where he set up a stability company and so on. So interesting connections may not be as strong, but it's still some of the key players in the computer revolution came from here. All right, now I've already introduced to you what is this AI. A very strong connection to AI is uh, what happened in Buffalo in the 1950s. A man called Frank Rosenblatt. The young man, he worked at uh, Calspan Corporation. At that time, it was known as Cornell Aeronautical Laboratories. And uh, he, he worked there. And uh, he had this, uh, you know, he was a cognitive type of scientist. And he wanted to actually build a machine that behaved like a brain. At that time, even in the 50s, uh, earlier on, uh, neuroscientists had figured out what a neuron in a brain is like. Uh, like it would have, a, a neuron would have several connections. And when all the other connections fired, this neuron would fire, or it would not fire based on what came in. It was this idea, and he actually decided to build a hardware. And this piece of hardware, he called it as a perceptron. It was known as a perceiving and recognizing automaton. And the technical report, uh, in date done here. And a very interesting connection here is that uh, uh, his work was uh, funded by a person called Marshall Yovitz. He died earlier this year in his 90s. Marshall Yovitz was the chairman of the Ohio State Computer Information Science Department. When I came there as a graduate student for 40, uh, actually 50 years, 48 years ago. And, uh, and Marshall Yovitz was his funder and he encouraged AI research in those days of this kind. This kind of AI was not well looked upon. It seemed like a quirky thing. You're trying to model the human neuron and what would the that going to be. Anyway, this is the connection. This is the kind of diagram he had. He had a diagram which says all the inputs come from from some image here, and there would be a weights so that that we're going to be multiplying each of these things, and we add them up and showed it. This is the kind of idea he had. And he had engineers wire the whole thing. There are some all kinds of pictures available of people looking at the wiring diagrams and picture, people uh, illuminating a printed character C over there see whether the computer can recognize C from a B, from an A, and so on. And then uh, the right picture, it's kind of a bit dark here, it's a man holding uh, some uh, resistors, rheostats and things like that. So this was all done in, in kind of analog hardware, and it picked them here in Buffalo, and that was the perceptron. And they called it the Mark I perceptron, <coughs> the first embodiment of their research. Today it sits in the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Perceptron still exists. And today, we have what's called as deep learning, and we still refer to the deep learning as the multi-layer perceptron. So that idea which started over here, uh, started uh, here in Buffalo. <coughs> so what happened was, this was done in a, in a location in Buffalo by, by Rosenblatt and, and so on. It was, it was not really accepted by the intellectual community in the, in the power centers like MIT and Stanford and so on. Uh, Marvin Pinsky, who is shown on the top left here, was, uh, was the, uh, was the you know, guru or leader of uh, AI in the world. And uh, he was considered the authority on it. He and, uh, he and his colleague, uh, Seymour Peppert uh, from MIT, they said what is, you know, there was a lot of publicity for perceptron. It was written up in the New York Times and so on, but a brain is being modeled uh, 60 years ago years ago in New York Times, there is a major article saying about AI. And uh, and Kominsky and, and Papa wrote a book saying, you know, this thing cannot even compute simple things. It can do a few operations, it cannot compute what's called the exclusive or operation. When two things are, uh, it, it fires only when uh, the both inputs are different, but when they're the same, it doesn't fire. It's called the exclusive or operation. It finally, it, it, they showed it cannot be done. And they showed this cannot be done, that cannot be done. This is a pretty useless type of idea. So, and they wrote a whole book called Perceptron, MIT Press, 1969. And the book came out, very influential people wrote that book. By that time, Rosenblatt died. Rosenblatt died a young man at 41. And so he couldn't uh, take his ideas further. And the idea of a neural network or a perceptron kind of died saying uh, the big AI people don't believe in it, let's not go any further. And Minsky was so influential, um, one of the earliest 
AI movies for 2001 Space Odyssey. <coughs> And uh, this movie was uh, done by Stanley Kubrick about uh, what can AI achieve. The movie came out in uh, 1970, that year. And uh, 2001 was 31 years away. So it seemed like a far, far time away. And what would AI be able to do in these 31 years? And that was kind of incorporated into, uh, into, into 2001. And there's a picture of uh, the computer that's called the HAL computer, H-A-L. The letters are one removed from IBM, uh, and uh, and Hal, I mean, they went. Uh, these were uh, astronauts going on a mission to uh, Jupiter, and uh, the computer is an AI computer, and uh, it at some point decides the human beings inside the craft cannot be trusted. They jeopardize the mission, so uh, whatever they say, I'm not going to follow. So it became a computer that uh, that takes over kind of stuff Elon Musk also talks about today. But uh, anyway, they kind of had all of these ideas. So speech recognition, you could talk to Hal, that's the face of Hal there. And uh, so anyway, he was very influential. So he was influential in perceptron. All right, now, no harm. UP started a computer science department in 1967, two years before before Minsky and Papert wrote uh, the book Perceptrons. Uh, and uh, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of our department last year. And right from the uh, early days of the department, uh, we've had a very strong AI component. People were very interested, faculty members were very interested in AI in the early days. Um, and uh, is that, uh, you know, I, I came here about 10 years after the department. Founded and my colleagues were some of these people. There was Nicholas Fidler, Nick Fidler on the top right. Uh, he wrote uh, a program for playing poker, computer <coughs> poker. And it was quite an achievement. Uh, it was on the cover page of uh, Scientific American. It was that, that important and interesting enough that Nick Fidler's uh, project uh, in around 1978 was both when it appeared. Gabor Herman was here. He was uh, one, of the, one of the pioneers of computer tomography. So when we go for a CAT scan or an MRI, what are the kinds of algorithms that analyze those images and, and produce those images? That was a computer vision type of problem. He was more of a mathematician, but one can regard that as an AI type of solution. It was done here in Buffalo. He had an amazing group here. Next is George Shapiro. And uh, we have uh, the privilege of having him here in the audience somewhere today. So he's over here. You know, I was, uh, was an inspirational figure as well. You know, I, I meant, you know, he and I have, have different viewpoints on AI, but uh, I keep telling him, you know, uh, we had we have respect for each other in different different schools of AI. And uh, you know, when you go to a, a website called Google Scholar, uh, the first thing they put their tagline is uh, on the shoulders of giants. All right, we have a giant, Stu Shapiro. His, his approach was knowledge representation and ideas like that. Um, and of course, I, I put my picture because I also came at that time. We were all colleagues at that time. And then we have Bill Rappaport, uh, who was a philosopher turned computer scientist. So we had all kinds of things going on. I think I've left out a few more. There were so many others who went, came and went. Uh, I left out anything current. My apologies. This is just a picture. Supposing we took a picture in 1978, 40 years ago. This is the AI that was going on in Buffalo. There was also Brian Funt and so on who came from Stanford. Yeah. All right, let's move on from the, uh, from 1978 to uh, around 1983. That was uh, 35 years ago. I was looking for funding. I was a, a young assistant professor here, and somebody told me that the U.S. Postal Service is trying to automate their reading machines. Uh, and I approached them saying, would you be willing to fund me to see whether uh, computers can read handwritten postal addresses? They first laughed at me, saying, I can't read my own handwriting. Can you get a computer to do this? Uh, and, uh, and so anyway, they gave me a small grant and so on. One thing led to the other. Uh, eventually, we became the largest uh, center for postal type of research here at UB. One time, we had 150 people in the group, all doing something related to postal work. Uh, the envelope you see here, you see the date on that on the top left? It's uh, 1996. It was what, about 22 years ago. That was when the first uh, postal handwritten address seat reading system went into operation. Uh, they installed it at the post office in Tampa, Florida. 
you see the cancellation on the top right, Stanford, Florida, October 1996. We were getting ready for Christmas season 1996. So that's when the handwritten mail hits the post office. They need most labor to, uh, to handle the mail. So we were, we were testing it at that time. And uh, I had, uh, I took one of the UV envelopes and I just wrote my own home address and uh, had it posted from Tampa to my home. And uh, lo and behold, it came home and it had a barcode on, at the bottom. And the barcode is what's called as a delivery point code at the postal address. It's the zip plus four plus two code. It is a five digit zip code. My zip code is 14221. And then it adds on uh, a, a, a four digit add on which is obtained from the, uh, uh, from the street, address, street address here and the block face actually, side of the street I live on. Uh, as a four digit, and then two more digits correspond to the last two digits of the street number. That's the 11 digit barcode. We correctly did the whole thing. And uh, so this took us, uh, that was 1996. My funding for the postal service started in uh, 1983. So that was, uh, that was another, it took us 13 years to get this uh, done from scratch that we started looking at. What does it take to recognize that? And this led to a lot of interest all over the world about uh, what is this problem that there's so much work is going on. And so people today, even today, say recognizing handwritten digits by computer is the fruit fly of AI. So uh, if you have a new idea in AI, can you recognize handwritten digits? You start there and then you go on to more complicated things. So it's the simplest organism you can think of as a test for AI. And to this day, when some of the greats in AI come out and say, I have a new idea, this is how it's got to be done. Well, okay, let's try it out first on handwritten digits. So what's called as the MNIST handwritten digits are used the world over as the standard today. And kind of, it all started when we were doing postal address reading here at the uh, And then that kind of one thing led to the other, and the Department of Justice, right, so much in the news. Department of Justice approached me and said, you guys are known for, you know, we got a lot of press on this, New York Times, everybody is writing about uh, handwriting reading machines. And so we were asked, well, would you be able to help us? The Department of Justice is facing a crisis that they cannot admit handwriting evidence in the courts in, in, in criminal cases because of a famous ruling for, as called as Daubert versus Merida Pharmaceuticals, which said unless there is a scientific justification for the expert expertise, it cannot be admitted as evidence in the court in front of a jury who don't know better. So the judge has to decide whether this evidence is going to be admitted. Handwriting was going to be out because there was no science to show that handwriting <coughs> recognition could be done in the sense who's the writer? Is it possible at all? So we got the very first project uh, in the world here comparing handwriting to see can we use our algorithms done for postal machines? Can we go about uh, looking at handwriting? Not for recognizing things but to say whether two things were written by the same person or not. And so we were able to write some influential papers uh, on this topic. It can indeed be done that uh, it is indeed possible to discriminate between people's handwriting if we have uh, training samples from, from, from them. And that allowed handwriting testimony to be continued to be presented in the courts. And to this day, it can be, it, it actually went up to several uh, several uh, you know, federal court cases. Where, so today, there is what's called like a Daubert hearing before a, a case is done, saying if there's going to be any kind of expertise, does it satisfy Daubert criteria? And we played a role in allowing handwriting testimony to be presented, which came out of this. This postal project was so large that we had uh, nearly 150 student people participating. Uh, we had uh, you know, dozens of PhD students, uh, we, many, many master's students, and so on, participating in so many projects. Many careers were made out of the work of the postal project. Uh, I just highlighted one of them here. Uh, today, one of the best algorithms for doing pattern recognition or classification Given something, can you say it is this or that? One of the top algorithms for it is called random forest. And the random forest algorithm was invented uh, by uh, my PhD student, uh, Jin Kam Ho. Uh, and uh, she is today a lead scientist at uh, Watson, which is the IBM spin-off in uh, uh, Manhattan. Uh, OK, so those are some of the connections. All right, uh, OK. Here is a little bit more. Uh, connections, which are kind of people, my talk is a little bit about people. Who are the people who did all of this? So uh, today, if you go and look around deep learning, that's what that's what the main technology that drives uh, uh, AI today. And if you go and look at who are the greats, you know, these are considered to be the, the great people, and they are indeed. 
Uh, interestingly, uh, I, I just uh, you know, have a connection to these people in the following way. On the left is Yan Lekun, who is a professor at uh, NYU, and he's, uh, he directs AI research at Facebook today. Uh, and next to him is uh, a legend called uh, Jeffrey Hinton. Uh, he is uh, he's an English. Yan Lekun is a French audition, lives in New York. Jeff, Jeffrey Hinton uh, is an Englishman. And uh, he used to be at CMU, but he decided uh, he liked Toronto better. He's a professor at the University of Toronto. And uh, he, he, again, is a, is a lead at, uh, at Google today. And uh, the third one is uh, Yoshia Bengio, who is actually a student of uh, Jeffrey Hinton in Montreal. Canada is a hotbed for, for AI research today. And the last of these is Andrew Ng. Uh, uh, and almost everybody who's gone to look for Coursera on machine learning and so on encounters Andrew Ng. He's very famous. And uh, he used to be a professor at Stanford. Uh, and, uh, and then he left Stanford because, uh, again, another company, Baidu, which is the equivalent of Google in China, decided, why do you want to work for Stanford? Come and work for us. And he moved. Uh, and what are the, what's the conne connection of, of these guys uh, to you here from Buffalo? Very interesting that when we had a huge postal project, the U.S. Postal Service said, there are some smart people at Bell Labs, you know. So uh, why don't you give them a subcontract from UB so they can help you with some of the recognition tasks that you're doing. And so we were asked to give a subcontract to Bell Labs. And the subcontract at, uh, at Bell Labs in Mumbai was Yang Le Kuhn. Uh, so anyway, those were the early days. We were all young at that time. I'm talking about 25 years ago. And Yan Lekun's connection to UB is that. Jeffrey Hinton, you know, he's an unbelievable legend. Uh, if he was in any other field, he should have got the Nobel Prize. There's no Nobel Prize for computer science. Uh, Jeffrey Hinton, he was in Toronto, and we were all young people 25 years ago. He called me from Toronto, UB, in Buffalo, and said, uh, Yeah, I know you guys are doing uh, handwriting recognition. Uh, can me and my students come and see what you're doing? I said, Sure, come on over. So uh, he brought all of his, his students uh, from Toronto to to Buffalo to see uh, what kind of algorithms we were using to recognize and continuously exchange ideas and so on. So those were the early days, uh, and that's my connection to Jeffrey Hinton. Joshua Bengio is actually a PhD student at Jeffrey Hinton, so he's my, he's my buddy's uh, student, so I have a connection to him. What's my connection to Andrew Ng? It's an interesting one. One of our master students at UB is another legendary figure today. His name is Robin Lee. Uh, he finished at uh, UB and eventually went back to China and he founded this company called Baidu, which is the equivalent of uh, Google. And you see a Baidu search engine box over there some years ago. And he founded that company and it was as successful as, uh, as Google in this country. He became uh, the richest man in China. He was a billionaire. And uh, I thought he would have forgotten me as it's, uh, our interaction was a short period of time. And they sent him a message on the day his company went IPO. And he responded back saying, uh, saying it all started in your lab. So it made my, made my day of whatever life that somebody did something worthwhile with what I had to uh, tell them about. Uh, and so my connection to uh, Andrew Ng, the famous Andrew Ng, is that my student uh, had him work for his company. <laughs> Leave his job from Stanford to work for his company. So connections here. All right. So let's go on. AI is not a solved problem. There's all kinds of problems that have been solved, AlphaGo has been solved, search and so on, Elevator has been solved. Very interesting AI paradox is uh, what are hard problems for people? As people playing Go or playing chess, all kinds of things are hard for us, but such tasks are easy for the computer. The AI algorithms can do that well. They can sort through a lot of data and figure out what are the paths and so on. On the other hand, the easy problems for us, we can recognize our friends, we can go find our way to a chair in the auditorium, we can do all kinds of simple things. To get a computer to do that or an AI to do that is extremely hard. So today, we are trying to solve this problem of general intelligence rather than narrow intelligence. Now, what does it take to solve uh, problems of general intelligence? So everyday type of thing that we do, which are, which are hard for the computer. So everyday life needs knowledge. So knowledge is intuitive and subjective. So the key challenge of AI is how to get the informal knowledge to the knowledge methods. So knowledge-based approach. So ideas for hardcore knowledge in a formal language. A computer can reason about statements in these languages using inference rules. 
So this is logic. We think of computers. Okay, you must be doing logical stuff, right? So that's the idea to do things logically, to uh, construct uh, the axioms and the rules and so on. So this is the kind of approach called the knowledge piece. <coughs> so this led to a. Uh, this is after uh, perceptrons vanished, uh, thanks to Minsky and Papert, and later on it all became knowledge-based AI, knowledge-based AI. <coughs> so we've all been hearing about AI. So it's that kind of AI knowledge-based AI, where inputs go to hand-designed programs based on knowledge-based reasoning, and there was output. The disadvantage of this, this was it was an unwieldy process. It required time of human experts. Who's to put the knowledge in? We got to have people tell them what, what the rules are. And people struggle to formalize rules with enough complexity to describe the word. How do you recognize your friend? In what, you know, what are the rules that you use for that? So asking people to, uh, to think about what rules they do so we can code it uh, in, in some kind of rule-based expert system was an impractical idea. It worked for things that you could spend a lot of time doing it, but uh, not easily generalized. So this led to the machine learning approach. So the difficulties of hard coding approach, so this allow computations to use, you figure out some representations. So the early approach was we will give you the representation and we will map the features to outputs. So we use what about this pattern recognition algorithm. One simple example was to decide whether the email coming into you is spam or not. So that was a simple machine learning algorithm. And it shows feature spaces where you're drawing lines between the uh, red crosses and the blue circles. Interestingly, red and blue are used in pattern recognition a lot long before uh, today's politics. Uh, and Oh, we have different algorithms that, that draw these lines in different ways. Some of them do better than the other. But the features were again given important. And there were uh, more complicated ones. Uh, this is uh, uh, an algorithm that draws a nonlinear boundary. Uh, and so you could get more complicated machine learning algorithms. But all of these machine learning approaches still needed some features to be input. But you are not using decision rules at the top level, but not logic based things, but doing a pattern recognition. So there are two paradigms AI. Rule-based system, which is input to hand-designed program to output. And the classic machine learning is input to hand-designed feature to mapping from features, which is pattern recognition to the output. And uh, only uh, this box here that uses use machine learning was mapping from features. So I've got a, a bunch of values and given these values, like it, it, it spam, we would say, it, does it have certain words? If an email, uh, the first word of email is hello, it's most likely spam. So it says, all right, uh, that's, good. that's probably the spam. So you would have features like that, which would tell you whether it's spam or not. So then came this deep learning rhythm. Simple machine learning depends on what's called as feature engineering. You still have to figure out. Somebody had to tell you that hello is an indicator of spam. So that's called feature engineering. Or you would, you would write a code, say, okay, recognize whether this object is a car. You would say, well, okay, let me write a program to see whether this thing has wheels on it, circles on it. And so that's what feature engineering. With, with a lot of difficulty, you would write such code. But it turns out for detecting a car, detecting wheels is not always a solution. Here are some peculiar cars, which uh, the wheel is not visible or only half visible or completely invisible because it is obscured and so on. So we got all of these scenarios. Uh, where feature engineering, spending a lot of time writing code to figure out whether it has a deal or not and then send it to an upper level decision maker, again was not feasible. So this is when deep learning came from. Deep learning is about saying we don't want to encode the rules, we don't want to feature engineer, we should just give the system raw data. And it should work from that to make its decision. And that's what learning representations of data around. So essentially, these methods understand the world as a hierarchy of concepts. An image, you get edges from the image. From the edges, you get regions from the image. Regions, you get objects from the image. The objects together define the uh, final, of, for example, the human face. So you would have edges and grouping so on, several levels, several levels. And that's the idea here, a hierarchy of concepts. Concepts built on top of each other, it is deep, several, several layers. 
Let me show some of the architecture here. We are going from an image to a final level, where, where on the way you are going through convolution, pooling, and all kinds of operations uh, to make the final decision. And there are weights along the way to, to figure out what feature is important, what feature is not important. And that whole thing is done by the picture on the right side, which is the central mathematical concept in this style of machine learning, which is called the deep learning, which is called gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, the central algorithm, and based on calculus. And uh, today, the, uh, the coding languages for these things are called tensor flow. Tensor flow is a flow of tensors with a generalization of the scalars, uh, vectors, matrices. Next thing is, uh, is, is tensors to be able to uh, pass along derivatives, multiply derivatives with weights, and so on. This kind of mathematics goes on. And these are layer derivatives. And this is basically the idea that Rosenblatt of Buffalo was trying to do. He just had one layer in those days. He didn't have like many, many layers. He just had one layer. With one layer, you could do only some simple computations. If only he had another layer. Actually, mathematical research says you could only have one more layer in computer distribution. But it might be impractical because that one layer might be too big. The depth in deep learning allows you to compute all kinds of complicated functions. So basically, machine learning is simply a method to compute what we call as a function. A function, all it does is takes an input, maps it to an output. And that's what it does. And if your output is, well, I need to recognize a cat or a face or a dog or what have you. And that is all done. So now we have three paradigms today. Rule-based system was the old one from the uh, from the 50s or 60s, maybe 70s, and then the classic machine learning method, maybe from the uh, 80s, and then on to today, which is uh, deep learning. There are more gray boxes here. Simple features, additional layers, uh, compute abstract features, and then mapping from the features is also done. So these are the three models. And where we are today is deep learning. This model. Actually, is it is this the final solution? Jeffrey Hinton just gave some interview saying we should start all over again. <laughs> He's saying we need one more, one more. So this might not be the ultimate, uh, ultimate uh, uh, solution. But that's where we are today. Okay. So let's go on now to the broad picture. I don't have all evening to talk to you about it. Uh, so let me let me talk about uh, uh, destruction software. Okay. So AI is <coughs> not just another toolbox. Tool, the toolbox. Okay, this is the deep learning box, we're just going to use it. It's, it's, it could be fairly profound that uh, AI, and people today are saying AI is, set to, is, is poised to disrupt the world, probably an AI uh, industrial revolution. But um, I, my perspective, of course, is not the whole world, but uh, as a teacher of computer science. And I find a disruption in computer science itself. AI is disrupting my field itself. Uh, some new terminology has come around. Uh, today, the big AI players are these big uh, companies. I already mentioned a few of them in Silicon Valley. Uh, one more of them is Tesla, uh, this company that makes cars. And they have, uh, they have another genius. Can uh, you bend and go? These are all mm -hmm. bend, bend, bend. These product engineers. Probably in the 20s, maybe early 30s, they're all coming up with new ideas. And uh, this guy called Karpati. Uh, he, uh, he's got this theory, which I tend to agree with, which uh, the classical software development is going to change. He says uh, the classical uh, stack, we call it in, in coding, he says the classical uh, stack in coding is, he calls it a software 1.0. You know, it is code we write. We, we, we have uh, a stack, it's called, you use a Linux, Linux operating system, Apache, MySQL database, Python, Perl, etc. It's called a stack make some of these choices which is stack. And that is software 1.0. It is today's software. Well, the view here is uh, software 1.0 is going to get changed by software 2.0. It's a new style all based on machine learning. And uh, the coding here is not in a user-friendly language like Java or C++. The coding is in a specifically user-unfriendly language. And uh, because this is a language that looks like that, you see the box on the uh, right hand side here, it's got a whole bunch of numbers in it, real numbers. 3.600 is the weight over here, 3.603 and so on. So these weights are all figured out by these neural networks, Rosenblatt's multi-layer perceptrons. They, they compute these kinds of numbers 
there are millions of these numbers which are computing what's going on. And there's no human involved at all in the coding. We're simply presenting it to it examples of what, what these are. And machine learning figures out what should be the weights to produce the kind of output you want. So there is no explicit coding, it's all based on samples and data. Uh, and and uh, continuing this this, uh, this part a little bit uh, more, we can talk about uh, if you have a program uh, <coughs> space like this, shown in this diagram uh, at the bottom here, by uh, writing each line of code, the programmer identifies a point in program space with some desirable behavior. If it's the word of one program, you're saying, that is the program I want. That's the program. And we kind of go about coding that program. This machine learning approach says, now we are restricting ourselves to something here blue region here and restricting search space to continuous subsets of program space and uh, we use this idea for stochastic gradient descent counter in zigzag through that to find the right So that's the kind of approach uh, which is different from uh, the current method of coding. So there are all kinds of benefits of this software to control. It's computationally homogeneous. The operations are only matrix multiplication and what's called as a rectilinear or rectified linear unit. Uh, simple to bake into silicon. This kind of a program that's going to be based on machine learning is easily made into hardware. Constant runtime, every iteration of power pass the same number of protein on the constant memory. Highly portable sequence of matrix multiplication. It's just sequence of mul matrix multiplication. Everything is being reduced to that. And uh, very agile. C++ is hard to speed up instead of remove half of the channels. Can melt into optimal code. You've got all these pieces of code that you've got. Everything is melted into one hole and you're draining the code together. Okay. Finally, it is better than you. <laughs> and anybody who can write the code. Okay. And another thing about how deep learning is disrupting the, you know, my field of computer science itself is uh, software developers in the past write and maintain layers of tangled code. All kinds of code, legacy code, people writing this and that and so on. And uh, the future now is going to be, we are not going to be writing code, we are just going to be curating the data. So how to get the data in the right order. So we become data curators and we analyze the results. And the kind of mathematics that we need in computer science is also making a dramatic change. We've always been saying for the last 50 years, in computer science, you only need discrete mathematics. Right? Uh, logic. So we are saying this new stuff is not based on logic, uh, math, logical mathematics or logic in this big math, but it's based on probability, it's based on calculus, because we're computing derivatives and things, multi linear algebra, about tensors and so on. But this is the kind of mathematics. The programming environments instead of C and Java, it's a tensor flow, PyTorch, go on, and most software jobs won't need programming. And uh, the diagram on the right says uh, all these uh, IT companies have developed their own environments for machine learning. Facebook uh, developed PyTorch, uh, and, uh, and Google developed TensorFlow, <coughs> Microsoft together with Amazon, both the Seattle companies, they have a framework called Gluon. These frameworks uh, allow you to code in this kind of new machine le learning language, and, uh, and it also allow it simply converts the code into a parallelizing them and it you know, takes a hardware called GPUs. Instead of CPUs, you have GPUs or general processing yeah. or uh, graphic processing. Um, so uh, people have been somewhat skeptical. Really? Is this going to happen in this far out? But uh, the lead at uh, Google, who is the, uh, who's the uh, head of their entire software division, uh, he said, I was very very skeptical about uh, this idea that all of software is going to get replaced. Then he went and looked at his own project. He's responsible for four projects at Google. This is upgrading search ranking. Of course, they have printed one way to search. And then data center energy usage is another project of this. And then language translation. We see that in Facebook and all. Translate from German to English and so on. And then, of course, solving Go. They are the ones who came up with that. So he looked at all these projects and there are a lot of conventional in it. He said, yeah. So he said at Alphabet, that is his company. And he said, yeah, all of this could be replaced by machine learning. I'm becoming a you know, follower of this idea. This is a new, new thought, this idea of software 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.
got this came about by Karpati, who, who was involved in Tesla doing these cars. He said there are two types of coding in, in the one I'm doing it to these Tesla cars. So there's one, one type of code written by humans, then another type of code which is undefined, decipherable, than the machine learning. And so right now maybe it's all equal, but I can see this is going to be getting the machine learning. So these are people right there who are making these observations. And there are other things, uh, repositories. Uh, today GitHub is the home for software 1.0 code. If you write new code in the, in the lab, you share it with others by putting it out there. Software 2.0 repositories are mainly data sets. You are trained on this data set. And commits uh, is about uh, making changes and so on, or additions and uh, edits uh, of the labels. All right, let me talk a little bit about the future of AI. The utopian view is that boring and back office jobs will be eliminated. Okay, so, whatever uh, things are done in the back office, like, you know, whatever accounting and and you can think of so many mundane jobs. People do that only because they need to make a living. So many of those kinds of uh, mundane jobs are going to be eliminated. While human facing jobs will remain, CEOs are important, right? The money and all that. So CEOs uh, are not going to be eliminated. But uh, nurses will not be eliminated. Human facing job or uh, home caregivers and so on. Anything involving humans or maybe animals too, right? Uh, a dog therapist. How would probably the job would be there and so on. And um, so, uh, uh, and intellectually challenging tasks will be solved, uh, like diagnosing disease. Of course, they talk about driving cars and uh, customer support and so on. These are all uh, going to be, uh, uh, many of these kinds of things will be solved. Dystopian view says the negative view of, oh, wow, you know, this AI is going to cause chaos. So, uh, well, what could be the chaos? Uh, they took a survey, and this is just a speculative survey. This is uh, the top uh, AI conference uh, today is called uh, Neural Information Processing Systems. It's a conference uh, that was, uh, uh, it's again based on neural networks. Neural. It was inspired by Rosenblatt. It was inspired by Jeffrey Hinton. The people started a small little thing. Let's just have a conference. Those of us who are doing the brain kind of thing. It was mostly Jeffrey Hinton and so on. And that conference is mushroom. Uh, today, that conference uh, finds it hard to find a location. So the last one, I think, had a, a registration of 8,000 people wanted to go there. And, uh, you know, the, uh, Mark Zuckerberg apparently went to the last one with bodyguards around him and so on. So, uh, but anyway, that's, uh, that's the kind of conference. And then there is also another one called uh, ICM International. These are all uh, the number of people who, who, who would like to go there are thousands. What they do is have, six months ahead of time, they close the registry, saying we cannot take more than 8,000, 10,000. We have to have a convention center and they record some of these events now. So, uh, and so if they ask these, uh, these people who come to these conferences, particularly the ones who had papers, etc. So these, these are people who know what's going on. They ask them when, when can computers be translating languages or driving trucks or working retail or work on research and work on humans in all and automating all human jobs uh, when is this going to happen. So anyway, this is a little bit fun type of thing, but it's a little bit scary, but uh, this is the, the kind of thing uh, that came out. But uh, I've seen other reports here like, uh, this was the, uh, the British magazine, uh, The Economist, um, saying that over 40% of the jobs at uh, risk in the next 20 years in the United States. That's the economist prediction. And uh, they said the effect is going to be more, not in the rich countries like the United States, but on the middle income countries. The middle income countries will lose 200 million jobs. Okay, this is all speculation, and this is what I'm kind of seeing out there. And uh, this is the kind of prediction. So AI uh, being poised to disrupt the world, has now uh, had a uh, 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 major uh, impact around countries. There are national initiatives uh, all over the world. Uh, just in the last two years, Canada has been a leader. Uh, in 2017, they began Canada with AI strategies. What the country is going to do about AI, which is going to hit us in society. And there are also opportunities as well in terms of developing AI. And uh, I was in India over the summer, and India started its own program 
called the National Strategy for AI, and I got a copy of the report on uh, July, August of this year, and I opened the report, and the first line of the report said, artificial intelligence is poised to disrupt the world. That's the first line of the India report, and according to other places, but anyway, that's, the, that's what they're saying, the India report. So let me uh, go on to conclude here, uh, AI at UB today. Uh, it is disrupting our enrollment in, in our own computer science department. Uh, uh, today, today, this semester I am offering a course called Introduction to Artificial Intelligence. Uh, early days when I taught, uh, uh, not art, but Introduction to Machine Learning, that's what it's called, Introduction to Machine Learning. When I taught a version of this course when I first came to UB 40 years ago, uh, I tried to get some students into my class and I couldn't even fill a class with 10 students. There are not that many people So today, I guess how many students are there? One, one class is uh, we have 350 students. 350 students in one class. There was no classroom big enough to hold 350 students. So we decided to break it up into two sections. Uh, these are the two sections that we discussed uh, last week. One of them uh, in Knox Hall and the other one in Knox Theater Hall. One class enrollment, so one, uh, 170 or something, maybe all students in one day. And uh, the other class is uh, the rest is 190 or so. Uh, and then there's a deep learning class uh, that I teach with 60 students. And there are a ton of other uh, which have uh, similar types of enrollment. Okay, my conclusion is that the AI revolution is uh, comparable in magnitude to the industrial revolution and some speculation. And Buffalo has had a historical role in the past in predicting technological And, and uh, AI is uh, forced to disrupt the world, and AI is already disrupting computer science. And uh, AI will eliminate uh, boring, repetitive jobs in the jobs, but there are opportunities and challenges in the AI. Okay, so Sorry, I So, any questions uh, at all from the audience? Which companies are, are making their biggest advances in AI today? In some of these companies, we are also familiar with, right? The AI leadership is coming from Facebook, Google. Fortunately, it's becoming a monopoly. Google doing everything. Uh, Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, and Tesla. Uh, they seem to uh, be the leading companies. Of course, there are uh, hundreds of smaller companies all over, maybe thousands of smaller companies. Everybody is doing something. But the big leaders who are kind of driving what we should be doing and who also have the data. They say today that, uh, you know, data is the new oil, right, or new gold, right? Data is the new gold. So they are the ones with all the gold, these companies. They have lots of data on everybody which they can use to construct better AI. That's what is needed for machine learning. So companies which have data are the big yeah. But in the future, healthcare, you know, like, Hospitals have a lot of data, and uh, and so they can, they are also sitting on a gold mine over there, and uh, they could also be using all of this data to. Actually, in India, they they have a program there to uh, have a different model. They are trying to say, why shouldn't people also profit from the data? It is my data you have. Yes, when that data is used, I should get back a little bit of that money for that. So there is a producer of data, a hospital. And there is a consumer of data, which is a company that's going to build something use, using your data. When that happens, um, you know, the ordinary people in the middle will benefit from it. So there is a new place happening. I don't know if it's going to happen in America, but there is a way that people would benefit. Uh, if they give their data, it should be, it should be paid for. Yeah. We have a question here. So, Hari, how would a deep learning program listen to your lecture and ask an intelligent question based on the material you presented. <laughs> the, the kind of question I would ask it would be easy for AI, but not the kind of question you ask Stu. <laughs> Stu has a brilliant mind, so. <laughs> All right, so yeah, I don't know. Uh, 
Do you played with Alexa and so on. They are doing pretty well. They understand what you're saying. So, how would it do? It would have to have speech recognition capability, and then it would have to go through uh, its uh, its. Uh, uh, of course, it would have to have learned these things. Stu's point is that somebody would have to put knowledge into that program that you it would have to use. Well, my point is that it's not that somebody wrote that code for the knowledge of presentation, but the knowledge has been learned by that program with experience of various kinds of listening to people generating questions. So it's a different model than the one that they did. In this case, it's all a bunch of numbers. The representation of that knowledge is in the form of millions and or billions or trillions of numbers. That's where the knowledge gets it. It's not in a way that's understandable to you and me, but that's how it's going to be. Um, given the time constraints, uh, you know, we'll have to move on.